Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're doing another book club episode. It is on biblical reasoning, Christological and Trinitarian rules for exegesis, and is written by Dr. Bobby Jameson and Dr. Tyler Whitman, and it is published by our good friends at Baker Academic. So we'll jump into this book club episode here in a moment. As always, just a few reminders on our show notes. There's a link to Baker Academic. So if you hit that link, it'll take you right to this book. You can um, see the other books that we've done throughout the the course of our book club episodes. We've done a lot of work with Baker. Uh, So check those out. Check out Baker and check out this book and get it for yourself. Uh, There's also some information about how to uh, find a local reformed church near you. So you hit that link, type in your zip code. You'll find the closest confessional and reformed churches near you. And then there's some information about how to contact ourselves, uh, questions about the show and um, comments or anything like that. You can contact uh, Peter or myself at uh, guiltgracepod at gmail.com, or you can find us on social media at uh, Twitter at guiltgracepod handle or the same handle on Instagram. You can also find us on YouTube. We take these recordings and it automatically has a video attached to it so uh viewers beware but uh, it's a you can you can still watch it on youtube um there's also some information about uh bridge builders so that's just uh, a group of people and organizations we call that that financially support our podcast ministry and keep us going so find out those different levels of how you can support us and give to us and we really appreciate it and maybe even if it I mean if it's just a small amount or you can't at all we're so grateful that you listen so uh without any more else to mention we'll jump in and have a further introduction of Dr. Jameson where we've had on multiple times before and for the first time Dr. Whitman yeah we have Dr. Bobby Jameson you guys have <laughs> listened to his interview with us on the paradox of sonship, and then also the path of being a pastor. He's associate pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., and Tyler Whitman, Dr. Tyler Whitman, is assistant professor of theology at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana, but it's a pleasure to have you guys on the show. Um, Yeah, so nice to meet you guys. Thanks for having us. Good to be with you again. Yeah, I was was, was watching as, as Nick was introducing this uh, I'm not sure what book Bobby's reading. I wasn't sure if it's biblical reasoning, if he was trying to catch up on his reading or he's reading something else. <laughs> I'm, uh, you just switched uh, it for those who are, who are listening. I was just following up on it. It's something totally different. It's for my current project. I'm on sabbatical. It's why I was late to this interview. I'm on sabbatical brain right now. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, no, yeah, no worries. Yeah, but it's, <clears throat> it's cool to have you guys uh, both on, and I think this has been a, um, a book people have been looking forward to. And we, we haven't asked <coughs> Bobby this question yet. Um, obviously, we haven't asked uh, Tyler this question yet either. Uh, but maybe we'll start with um, Tyler, since we haven't had you on yet. Uh, tell us tell us a bit about yourself, your your background, your current work in ministry, and then we'll kind of, kind of lead into what got you into writing about biblical reasoning. And we'll go to Bobby after this. Yeah, well, as you mentioned, I, I, I teach theology here at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary um, in New Orleans, Louisiana. I've been here for about two years, I'm about to start my third. Uh, before that, I was uh, I was teaching in Louisville and at another Baptist school. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, Baptist born and Baptist, uh, you know, what, what is it, bread when I die? Maybe I'll be Baptist dead. I, 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 I forget the little adage, but uh, I got you. Maybe, pastor. yeah, maybe Baptist on earth, which would be Presbyterian. Yeah. yeah. Pre- <laughs> Presbyterian <laughs> resurrected. <laughs> oh, we have, man, we have guys, to make some sort of joke in the middle yeah, of it. So. There, there will be surprises for us all. Um, but um, yeah, I'm sure that, uh, I mean, I, I grew up uh, Baptist in a Baptist uh, pastor's home. Uh, my, my father's a pastor, so I'm a pastor's kid, missionary kid. Just uh, got into. Uh, theology kind of in the course of seminary and was encouraged by you know several professors and uh, some mentors to kind of pursue teaching and 
and here I am, right? Um, one thing led to another. So uh, married um, happily, four kids and one kitten. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I just- um, For those who didn't hear, you said four kids and one kitten. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about uh, a bit about me. Yeah, a systematic theology is kind of my um, what my specialty, my area of learned ignorance, and uh, so uh, particularly interested in obviously the themes of, of this book, um, Trinitarian theology, uh, Christology, but uh, current research is kind of really focusing on the doctrine of creation, and then um, maybe like a long term project on the uh on a kind of moral dogmatics of god's perfection so uh yeah we'll kind of see where that goes but yeah that's awesome. a bit about me oh cool. bobby yeah, what about you sure yeah i grew up in california i uh, was originally going to be a jazz saxophonist but redirected to ministry in my undergrad years um came out to capitol hill baptist to intern at the church as a pastoral training kind of program and that that created a relationship with the church that's lasted now almost 15 years, went, went away to, to seminary. I was at Southern, which is where Tyler and I became friends. Um, yeah, PhD in, PhD in Cambridge in New Testament, and then back here in, in DC at Capitol Hill Baptist as a pastor for the last five years. And um, I've, I've had a, a long-term interest in these doctrines, uh, Trinity and Christology, as well as how exegesis and theology fit together. And, you know, as we talk about in the book, kind of the doctrines of the person of Christ and the Trinity are two of the real pressure points between kind of what the church has always believed and what the modern biblical studies guild is willing to believe or willing to find in the text. Right. And so in a sense, um, getting graduate training in New Testament kind of pushed me toward in different ways, looking more deeply at those issues. So you guys had me on for the paradox of sonship. Yep. That was definitely a project in this direction. And Tyler was helpful with me with kind of forming the framework of that book. And then, um, yeah, I mean, we can get into this more in a minute, but it was really some conversations he and I had after I wrote that, um, where I wanted to kind of keep developing stuff in this area that led to a more systematic consideration of Trinity and Christology and the relationship between exegesis and theology. Did you want to get into current projects too? Yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of we'll kind of get into that too. I want to I want to dig a little deeper. Sure. Maybe if you want to talk about it, and this is probably not the question you're expecting, but you are a jazz saxophonist. Do you still <laughs> do you still play the saxophone? Not a whole lot. Life's busy. Four kids. I'm serving as a pastor, um, so once in a while. Is it is it like is it like riding a bike where if you went back to the saxophone you can do it again if you wanted to? Yeah, that's right. But I, I'm a little rusty. My skills have atrophied a little, but it's in there deep. Nice. So Bobby's actually Bobby's actually on an episode of Gilmore Girls playing the saxophone. <laughs> Is he really? True. Yeah, true. True. Yep. really. And my hair, yeah. my hair was looking about <laughs> like this back then. So you were actually on Gilmore Girls. <laughs> Part of a big band. You see my face for like the blink of an eye. <laughs> Twinkling of an eye. What? That's hilarious. That there is you go. That's 15 true. milliseconds of fame. Right. Yep. It, so whenever whenever you guys have like those uh youth group openings like the icebreakers like things you didn't know about there me. it is that your thing <laughs> pretty much actually i gotta i gotta store that one away yeah <laughs> like cool um yeah we'll, we'll talk <clears throat> more about some of this stuff too um but you you kind of dipped into it so whoever wants to start on this one so how how did you both come about writing biblical reasoning because I'm, I'm thinking people who think about biblical reasoning is like, okay like i want to reason like the bible does um but like what so what is biblical reasoning and what's What's your major premise or your thesis in this that you want to drive into your readers after they read it? Well, I'll let Bobby tackle the thesis and stuff. The way that we came to write it together was just kind of um, providential. <clears throat> I think I felt, um, I, I, I remember back, you know, in, in, in seminary reading Lewis Ayer's Nicaea and its Legacy. This was probably like 2012 and reading Augustine's De Trinitate at the same time and seeing how the fathers were reading the scriptures and then uh, how that led to their doctrinal formulations. And I thought, why wasn't, um, you know, why haven't I ever really been exposed to this before? And uh, because I, I, I hadn't, right? And, uh, and I thought this is a great way of, of, of learning this material. And so I remember kind of trying to convince a mutual friend of Bobby and I to write uh, a book like this. And, uh, and of course he had bigger fish to fry. Um, and so, <laughs> I always was trying to find somebody to write this, uh, write a book that ended up kind of becoming this. And so I, I always thought, yeah, we need something that approaches this exegetically. 
but I didn't really have in mind biblical reasoning. I had just some kind of nebulous idea of a book. And I think, you know, Bobby and I, we obviously had conversations about theological interpretation and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and doctrine and, and these issues. And I think then we were having conversations then kind of, uh, you know, at the end of our PhDs and Bobby had written this book uh, on the paradox of sonship. And we were both kind of just obsessed with things that we ended up kind of finding their way in, in biblical reasoning. And I was like, Bobby, we should write this book. And, um, and so then the conversation started happening between us because we were both on this kind of, you know, trajectory of, of, of really uh, thinking about these issues. And it was really cool over the conversations that we started having, the book started taking shape and, uh, and, and ended up being something uh, weirder and I think better than anything I think either of us had had thought about previously and and kind of that's what you have here but Bobby you you wrote the introduction to the book why don't you talk about the <laughs> yeah. main thesis of it yeah sure yeah well and I, I Tyler Tyler said it all very well I'll just add one thing to the kind of um history of the book for me you know Tyler mentioned reading Lewis Ayers and reading Augustine for me one formative influence was reading John Webster who was Tyler's doctoral supervisor and I read some of Webster's seminal essays while I was a seminary student and especially his essays on biblical reasoning and principles of systematic theology when I read those I thought wow this this puts the relationship between theology and exegesis better than anything I've been exposed to. And, and in a way that seemed clearer and more compelling than some of the, the ways I had been, you know, taught in reading some standard evangelical works. Um, and so I remember typing that in, typing in some quotes from Webster and just going, wow, this is, I wish I could make everybody read this, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and and um, Webster's and really hard this, to read, too, for those who are listening. He, he is a, yeah, that's right. He is a very dense and, and in some ways demanding writer. Um, so I think, but I think it's really his thesis in his essay, Biblical Reasoning, that is the thesis of our book. And, and one simple way of putting it, which we summarize in the introduction, this is page 22 in Roman numerals. Um, <laughs> here's one way of say, saying the overall goal of the book. Hence, we aim to show that these doctrines, that is the incarnation and the Trinity, are more biblical than many think. And that a right reading of scripture requires more theology than many are willing to grant because they are distilled from a right reading of scripture. Classical doctrines about Christ and the Trinity constitute a well-stocked keychain that can open exegetical doors, uh, doors that would otherwise remain shut in the face of modern exegetical conventions. In other words, uh, because you get the doctrines of the person of Christ and the Trinity from Scripture, there are ways of articulating those doctrines that actually become exegetical guidelines, rules, tools uh, that help you read individual passages of Scripture better. So in a sense, we work through throughout the book. We articulate a number of theological principles that we then distill into exegetical rules, and we try to show the worth of those rules in reading individual passages of scripture. Everything from what does it mean that God is said to repent or change his mind, to what does it mean when Jesus says he's less than the Father, to uh, then a kind of capstone chapter at the very end that's a passage of John that combines a whole lot of this stuff and Jesus is teaching about himself and the Father. Hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. So some of our audience is pretty new to these categories. So I'd like to be able to define some terms. And I think the first one that pops out would be exegesis. If you could kind of define that for people. Exegesis is just opening up and explaining the text, um, setting it out into, into the open. So exegesis is really just a matter of, it's kind of a, kind of a fancy word for in, in, interpreting, right? Um, laying bare something. So, um really you know biblical exegesis is just concerned with um explaining the text what mm -hmm. what does it mean right mm -hmm. bobby probably has a much more sophisticated uh, answer sophisticated answer no. to that. yeah yeah no. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know? that's, about, that's about it it's just saying what no, the bible means yeah <laughs> yeah so it's, it's kind of like our hermeneutics is what we bring to the text and exegesis is what we get out of the text yeah, you could say of, that or yeah go ahead go ahead, yeah. go ahead go ahead oh just um i mean uh in a sense hermeneutics would be tools for doing exegesis um or a framework for exegesis and in some ways you, you in, in a way you're right we always bring something to the text um but the question is 
uh, what is the right set of tools for the text? And, and so there's a there's inevitably a circle or a spiral here where, you know, different types of text want to be read in different ways. Uh, a children's classical fable wants to be read differently from a newspaper article, wants to be read differently from uh, an Annie Dillard essay book. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do is get a set of hermeneutical tools from scripture, particularly from scripture's doctrinal teachings about who God is, to say, well, if scripture is ultimately about God and ultimately about bringing us into covenantal fellowship with God, um, if that's who it's about, and that's what its ultimate goal is, we want to form a hermeneutic. We want to form an approach to reading scripture that's actually derived from scripture itself. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, so on to my first real question. Um, so part one of the book focuses on Christ as key to exegesis and reasoning. And then part two is on Christology and Trinitarian dogmatics. So how does this approach aid our reasoning of the text? And what is the result when we read the text in this way? Tyler, do you want to talk about the relationship between parts one and two? Yeah, so part part one is is basically setting up a kind of framework for, um, and, and it's interesting the way that you put it. It's a, a kind of how, how how Christ is the uh, the key to kind of showing um, this framework because that's I think um, very much to the heart of our intention there. So part one articulates a framework for the, what the book of reasoning is, okay, and uh, and then part two explains that what the subtitle says, right, the Christological and the Trinitarian rules for Jesus. So in part one, we're exploring, uh, if you just look at, if you pay t careful attention to Jesus himself, okay, as he's presented to us in the Gospels and, you know, the book of Revelation and, and, and some other key point kind of areas that I, uh, that, 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 you know, focus in on, on part one. I said I because I was the chief author of those chapters. Bobby was the chief author of some of the later chapters. Uh, we explained that in, in, in introduction. But the, the goal there, our, our goal in part one is um, to show if you just listen to Jesus, for instance, his famous uh, high priestly prayer in John 17, you know, the, the kind of climactic request that he um, gives his father, right, is that we would see his glory. <clears throat> okay. And so that kind of sets us off on terms of what's the aim, right? Well, if we take our aim from Jesus, what is Jesus' desire for us that we see his glory? So that should be the desire of his disciples, and it should be the desire of those who pay attention to his teaching, which is found in his word. And you know, chapter two really explores, well, what does it mean for Christ to be our teacher, right? And we explore this theme of divine teaching and how that uh, really takes us deeper into what we're, what, what's actually happening when we're reading the Bible. Um, and we end up saying, well, what's happening when we're reading the Bible is that we're being taught by Christ um, through his spirit so that we can be um, led through Christ, my spirit, right, to uh, the Father and, and, and that we might know him right in um in grace and in truth and and how that basically molds our approach to scripture right and then chapter three really kind of sets out well in light of this you know we look at the opening of, of revelation and we see how the ascended christ is addressing uh the, the churches in asia minor you know um in his kind of ascended state right and we say well what does this tell us about what scripture is and how it's functioning um to us, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis us right now, right? Um, Christ has has uh, left, right? And we are awaiting his return. And um, what does that say about the nature of scripture and, and how we read it? And so we kind of crystallize all these into our first kind of principles and our first um, uh, couple of rules about how we read scripture. And we're basically saying when we're reading, what's going on is we're trying to pay attention to those areas where Christ himself is nudging us in certain directions to draw certain conclusions. And um, those conclusions and, and, and that direction is all kind of moving towards achieving this vision of his glory that he wants for us. And so what that means then is that as we go on to explore in part two, all the Trinitarian Christological rules, these things are, um, are ways that Christ himself through his teaching is sanctifying us so that we might behold his glory. And so they are deeply, it, it's, it, it, one and the same time, doctrine and exegesis, they're all part of this kind of um, spiritual journey, right? Um, led by Christ as our attention is focused on Christ so that he might show us his glory um, in the resurrection so that we can see by faith now, right? What we will, uh, and, and in part, 
um, what we will behold um, uh, clearly, right, in uh, the resurrection. Mm. So that then leads to the principles and the rules of, of, of part two. And that's really, you know, I, I wrote some of those chapters that, that Bobby, you know, that, that, that maybe he wants to take off on what's yeah. going on there. <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. So, so to pick up there, I think you could um, you could summarize, you know, the whole first half that again Tyler was the primary author for by saying, you know, these um, theological discernment leads us deeper into the witness of Scripture, and the witness of Scripture leads us deeper into the knowledge of and fellowship with God. And uh, because Christ is the central subject of Scripture, and the knowledge of God in the face of Christ is our ultimate destiny and is how we are uh, increasingly sanctified here in this life. Um, we, we sort of deliberately craft a, a set of theological and exegetical tools and rules around uh, the person of Christ and how he reveals God to us. So in a sense, we're deliberately centering scripture's central subject in how we try to formulate rules for reading scripture. So we're not doing like a biblical theology where we go kind of start to finish on all sorts of themes, um, which is which is valid and wonderful. We're not doing a kind of, you know, more historically oriented survey type reading. Uh, but what we are doing is trying to form uh, kind of kind of outfit people for engaging more deeply with the very center and substance of scripture. So in that sense, the, the principles and rules in the back half of the book, in one way or another, all focus on Christ. Uh, who he is in himself, his divinity and humanity, how he relates to the Father and the Spirit eternally, and so on. So in a sense, they're kind of um, – the rules in the back half of the book are both Christological and Trinitarian because when you look deeply at Jesus, uh, you see through him to the Father uh, and to the Spirit who eternally proceeds from him and the Father and who he sends uh, to carry on his mission. So that's a little bit of kind of the th how the thematic unity of the book un unfolds. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, maybe to, to wrap around, so that the, the audience can kind of wrap around this, and I, I think what you said at the beginning is helpful for this. It sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if, I'm, if I'm on the right path for what you guys are trying to do in the book, it's, you're not trying to go maybe into like a, a, like a fresh reading of the Bible each time and saying, I'm going to leave everything kind of to the side. I'm just going to read this, me and my Bible without anything else kind of inhibiting this, and I'm going to read this for the first time where as you read it, it's actually informing the way you read it. So the more you read it, the more you understand it, the better you exegete it. That actually tells you how to read it better the next time. Is that, is that right? That's definitely a big part of it. Uh, absolutely. That we're trying to see a kind of virtuous circle or virtuous spiral between theology and exegesis, where everything you've rightly learned from scripture, you bring with you the next time you read scripture. And that it's not a you know, because scripture is a revelation of inexhaustible mysteries, we don't sort of hit a wall and go, oh, that's all we can learn about God. Oh, we figured it all out. You know, but we progress deeper into these mysteries. Um, and so our sort of toolkit is aimed specifically at helping people do that. Yeah, that's right. And that's not to say that once you kind of like learn something from the Bible, let's say you learn about, you know, God's, you know, immutability or something or you, you kind of get like a, a, a conception of god's perfection in mind and that like that learning process is arrested then and you're like well i've got that tool now and i kind of you know i've got that nailed down and i can just read the bible through that lens they we, we articulated in a number of points how that process is always a kind of it's it's one like bobby said it's deepening and it's also uh, one of being open to being corrected you know because we are fallible and and uh our achieved understanding is always open to refinement and correction by god's word and so that process of rereading scripture is actually very important because that's uh you know god christ alone has the words of life right so we're, we're constantly returning to him so you know a, a pretty bad way of understanding what we're up to in this book would be that well they just kind of do a little systematic theology bit, and then they use that as a kind of procrustia bed, right, uh, through which to read individual passages of scripture. No. That's that's not what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to say scripture is actually you pay very careful attention to the shape of particular, you know, instances of biblical discourse. It's trying to train you in certain patterns of thought mm -hmm. and attention, right? And those patterns are themselves kind of regulative. Right. They, they, they furnish you with rules, you know, and um, so a better understanding of those biblical discourses of the Bible's grammar, as we call it, um, will furnish you with 
improved rules. So, you know, it might be that you, know, you could come up with better rules than the ones we have, but what we're trying to do is show that this is actually a pretty generative way of reading scripture, a pretty healthy way. Um, and uh, I mean, open to correction as it may be, um, it's one that I think it is a bit more honest about what's going on in terms of the relationship between exegesis and theology. Yeah. If I could just make two two quick follow up comments yeah. to that, um, in a similar direction. One would be I can't remember if we use this metaphor in the book or not, but um, you know you can think about a map, and and the better you know a map, provided it's an accurate map, the more kind of freely and capably you can go explore some uh, you know backwoods backcountry territory on a backpacking trip or something like that, right? Knowing the map enables you to roam more confidently, go farther, uh, explore more detail. The map isn't constraining or constricting you, it's enabling you to kind of uh, then go see the richness of the thing itself. And so in some ways, we're kind of treating theology as a map. It's not a it's not a, a sort of limiting factor. It's an enabling factor in how you read scripture. The other thing would be, you know, thinking about the things we bring to the Bible when reading the Bible. Well, if you read left to right and you start with the very first sentence of scripture, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, um, you've got a whole worldview uh, you know, kind of bundled up in that one sentence. There's God, there's everything else. Everything else only exists because of God. God doesn't depend on all the things he made because he made them. I mean, so you've you've <laughs> you've already got a radically different worldview from naturalistic secularism or polytheistic, any type of polytheistic religion or anything like that. I mean, just in one sentence uh, at the very beginning. And so if we're going to read scripture as any kind of coherent whole, you, you know, to forget Genesis 1-1, uh, if you are reading any other part of the Bible, is a kind of foolish, willful, not the, reading the book the way it's meant to be read kind of thing. So, so in some sense, we're saying theology is inevitable when you read scripture. The only question is, is it going to be the right theology? Hmm. No, that's good. That's good. And these, these doctrines and dogmatics are super helpful. And it, you know, it makes reminds me of a conversation I had the other day with an individual who claims to be Christian, but represents a church that doesn't believe in the Trinity. And I'm just like, you need to go back to, you know, these, these things that we ecumenically can agree upon as Christians that, that Trinitarian dogmatics and how, how to, that we must view our God in as a Trinitarian God. And a book like this is so helpful for Christians today to have these discussions with either Christians that uh, out there that say they're Christians and they don't understand or see a Trinity um, or even unbelievers too. Because that, that's a huge question people have is they're so confused about how to understand Trinitarian dogmatics, right? So thank you for this work. So um I don't know if you have a comment on what I just said before I jump into this question. No, it's but, great. Uh, um, uh, oh, so just, our, just to say, just to say, um, you know, we're not doing that apologetic work directly, but we hope that one big takeaway from the book would be helping yeah. people see how, for instance, the Trinity is deeply biblical and e yeah. equipping people, equipping people for conversations, apologetics, uh, stuff like that. We yeah. hope it'll be, you know, supply lines for all that sure. type of thing. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Beautiful. So our guess is most think the Trinity is really only a logical deduction of the pages of scripture, but not an aid or lack of, or for lack of a better term, for exegesing, exegeting the very same pages of scripture. So how does understanding the Trinity's unity, inseparable operations, and the unified work of the three members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, aid us in reading of the scriptures. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, uh, you know, w w the idea that, that the doctrine of the Trinity, for instance, is a, uh, a kind of logical, um, you know, deduction from scripture. And it's this kind of, uh, it's something other than exegesis. It's may maybe a kind of work of a, a, of a different kind of way of, of thinking, right? That employs a lot of philosophy and stuff and maybe you know improves upon and, and says something other than what scripture says that's definitely something that we're pushing back against as well we're trying to say no what we know of as the doctrine of the trinity is not something that's taught to us primarily by the church fathers for instance it's 
primarily taught to us by Jesus himself. And that's actually how the fathers understood it, right? <laughs> you, can, you can kind of read um, the language of the Chalcedonian definition, for instance, and, um, or, 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 or the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And you, know, you, you see the fathers, their self-understanding is that they're not saying something other than what scripture is saying. They're using non-scriptural language, of course, with scriptural language. But they're just trying to say this is what the, this is what Christ teaches us, right? Uh, through the Spirit in Scripture itself. So we're trying to show that that's actually what, what's going on. Uh, the Trinity is actually the reality without which the Bible doesn't actually cohere together as one book, the Old and the New Testaments. And in fact, that's one of the key kind of points of departure, right? I think maybe from the type of approach to the Bible that our book represents from what you find in a lot of perhaps mainstream biblical scholarship these days is the unity of scripture. And, um, you know, the unity of scripture and the unity of God, these are, these are two kind of conversations that happen simultaneously quite early on in the church. You know, Irenaeus, uh, it, 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 he's really um, arguing for this, you know, against, uh, kind of Valentinian Gnosticism. And, you know, a lot of biblical scholarship these days would would kind of see a lot of, uh, not just plurality in terms of different kind of emphases and voices and so forth in scripture, but outright contradictions, right, between parts yeah. of scripture. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Bobby, that's my kind of uh, reading of the Biblical yeah. Studies Guild. Absolutely, and yep. So, you know, we, we kind of say early on, it's like, well, that's that's one pill you got to swallow, right? And, and we kind of, we, we try to show that that's, you know, there in the Bible. Um, but it's just Christians have always read that, read it that way, right? Uh, from quite early on, it's, it's one book. Well, if it's one book, the Trinity is kind of, you know, that without which you can't make sense of that claim, right? Um, so doctrine of Trinity, unity of the Bible, these kind of go hand in hand. And so um, if you if you read the Bible in this way, well, this is the God you're talking about. And um, so that's really what we're trying to show. We're not trying to, you know, we get into some of the, the metaphysical and the kind of deeper scholastic elements of the doctrine here and there. But at every point, every step of the way, we're trying to say, these are just different ways of saying what's plainly being said in scripture itself. Yeah. So we are trying to main, maintain a, 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 a pretty disciplined transparency to um, the Bible. So even when we talk, for instance, about one of the doctrines you mentioned, inseparable operations or the indivisible outward works of the Trinity, um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we attempt to show like even the language of indivisibility or inseparability, like that's even got biblical grounds, right? I mean, so we're, we're trying to show these things are really transparent. Why fuss about these doctrines? Well, because Christ teaches them to us, right? Mm -hmm. And because understanding them actually helps us to understand what's going on in, in baptism, what's going on in any act of Christian worship, what's going on when you read the Bible, right? Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, it's pointing us towards, again, uh, a kind of conception of that glory that the Father, Son, and the Spirit uh, share equally, and uh, that we will behold in Christ, right? So mm -hmm. um, their, their utility is not only in opening up the passage of Scripture and helping us to not draw wrong conclusions and so forth right and, and, and to avoid heresy but also it's, it's it's to aid our apprehension of christ's glory yeah it sounds like the trinity is the bones of scripture and it may the word trinity may not explicitly be ever brought forth but it is in the it is the scripture it's the bones of it it's, it's way it's the way scripture's held up sounds like what you're saying yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you don't, if you, uh, you know, if you don't agree with the, the doctrine of the Trinity, then you don't think that the Old and New Testaments are um, one, one right. book, right? Um, they, they, they kind of go, go together, right? You think that uh, you, you have to kind of draw some points of division there, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if you read the New Testament against the background of the Old Testament, the doctrine of the Trinity is the inevitable presupposition of what you're reading. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so something you, you said, um, I, I want to, want to dig into, um, before I get into the, to the next question, um, and maybe again, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong and I'm trying to kind of channel in our, our listeners, 
because uh, you're talking about exe exegesis leading us to theology and theology leading us back to exegesis. Um, and I'm thinking around the Trinity and stuff, and I think our, our words usually are, um, well, this is a logical deduction from the text, although the text itself may not say it. It's a deduction we can make from the text, which sounds a little bit different than what you guys are saying. It sounds like, no, this actually comes from the text, not just a deduction from the text and actually helps us read the text better. Does, does, that, does that make sense? Am I, am, I, am I catching what you guys are saying? Yeah, Bobby, why, why, don't, why don't you illustrate that, Bobby, like concretely with like part of it? Yeah, sure. Of yeah, sure. So um, let me think about a couple of passages really quick. Um, you know, one, okay, so one would be in, in Romans 9, 5, where Paul says that the Christ uh, is from their race, that is from the Jewish race, according to the flesh. Okay, well, why does he say he's from the Jewish race according to the flesh? Well, the 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 verse that's in is disputed, um, but we think, and many scholars think, that he's actually acclaiming Christ as God, that he says uh, Christ is God overall, blessed forever, amen. And so Paul mentions that Christ is of the Jewish people according to the flesh because uh, that lineage, that uh, derivation, so to speak, is not the only one he has. Insofar as he's a human being, he's of the Jewish people. Uh, everybody knew that. There's no dispute. Um, and, and Paul's talking about the Messiah's relation to his you know, ethnic family. Um, but Paul limits the scope of what he's saying to uh, according to the flesh. Because in the same breath, basically, he's also ascribing divinity to Christ. Now, um, there are certain technical terms about, you know, person, hypostasis, uh, nature, Greek physis, that type of thing, that you can use to get purchase on and clarify, well, what is one in Christ and what is two in Christ and how is he both unified and twofold? And those add a certain kind of conceptual clarity. Um, but if you want to talk about the reality of the incarnation, that Christ is both God and man, we would say in Romans 9, 5, that reality is simply taught. That reality is simply present. Uh, that is what Paul is saying. Admittedly, with varying degrees of explicitness, you know, depending on this verse, this phrase, etc. Or for instance, like in Philippians 2, 6 and 7, you know, he who exists in the form of God uh, took on the form of a servant being found in human likeness. So he exists, and before his incarnation, uh, possessed the form of God, he took on, he entered into union with the form of a servant. Um, so again, the kind of, if you want to ask, for instance, about the incarnation, is that an implication from scripture? I think we would say, well, uh, implication doesn't quite put it strongly enough. Rather, it's the positive teaching of scripture. You, you need to form a sentence that goes something like, scripture teaches that Christ is God, the son become incarnate. Scripture teaches uh, that who Christ is, is eternally God, and what he became is a human being to save us. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think you're right. We are trying to push for, for a closer identity where, and again, this is how the fathers saw it. You know, if you read, if you read patristic commentaries like uh, Cyril of Alexandria on John's gospel, he'll say stuff about, you know, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he'll point out all the errors that this rules out, and he'll ascribe it to prophetic agency. He'll say, you know, John, being inspired by the Spirit, was ruling out uh, an Arian error. He was ruling out a modalist kind of error. He was ruling out all these different possible errors by speaking prophetically of who Christ is as God. And um, so, so yeah, I think, I think when a, perhaps even someone who means to affirm the Trinity or articulate the doctrine of the Trinity, if you're only willing to say this is an inference from scripture, mm -hmm. you're sort of keeping it at one level removed and therefore one degree less confident. Like, well, we really might be wrong about this. The next time we open up the Bible, maybe it doesn't really seem Trinitarian. Whereas somebody like B.B. Warfield 100 years ago said, uh, the sense of scripture is the scripture, meaning the reality can be present, even if not the exact word. Yeah. We're, when you articulate a teaching, you're, you're bringing together, you're summarizing, you're, you're uh, hold, sort of holding up into the light, you know, the, the full weight of what scripture is teaching. And so we would say that in summary, the doctrines of the Trinity and the person of Christ uh, really are taught in scripture. And one of our main goals is to try to show kind of the manner in which those things are present. We're not trying to claim more for the text than is really there, but we're also trying to give a, a kind of 
show the proper supporting role of some of those terms and concepts. And, and the analogy we use is grammar. Like if, if I say, you know, she hit the ball to him, and then we start talking about subject, verb, object, indirect object. If you understand all those things rightly, there's a sense in which those grammar terms don't add anything to the sentence. There is a subject, she. There is a verb, hit. There is an object, ball, and so on. And those grammatical terms just enable you to understand what's actually there in the sentence. Uh, there's someone, do, there's someone, that someone is doing something. Uh, she's doing it to something that affects someone else. You know, the grammar terms just allow you to understand what's there and how it all relates together. And so in some ways, we're, we're drawing on a tradition of understanding theology that treats it as grammar, um, that it's not, it's not sort of adding anything to the text, but enabling an understanding of the text. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I think that I, I think my, my guess, real quick too. That's my guess is that's the primary understanding of most listeners or most who come to the text is saying maybe I can get these doctrines by like pulling around some different things and, and inferences here and there. But it's not actually really totally in this text as the text is telling me. It's like how you fit all these things together. The church fathers did it. I'm not really sure how they did it, um, and then I'm not really sure like. What am I supposed to do with this stuff? Maybe it's just some things that like stick in my head. It's really good to know. Um, but like you said, it's, I think it's helpful. Um, I've never heard it put that way, where this is actually comes from the language of the text. We may use maybe different terms for some of this stuff, but it comes from the text and it actually tells us how to come back to the text and read the text itself. Yeah, you know, one of the ways of, uh, of saying the same thing Bobby just said, and, 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 and kind of tying back to your question is to flip, flip what you were, what you were talking about on its head. You know, you, some people think the doctrine of Trinity is, well, maybe an implication of this text or something like that. Flip that on its head. Um, the very, uh, you know, kind of phrases and the, you know, the things that the biblical authors, the way that they talk about God and the way that they don't talk about God, you know, for instance, you know, Paul will say that God, you know, the, that, you know, the father is God. He'll say, uh, you know, the, the, or the father is Lord. He'll say the son is Lord. He'll say the spirit is Lord, but he doesn't say that there's three Lords. Mm -hmm. He still says there's only one Lord. You know, why? That's weird. You know, no one would do that. You know, <laughs> like if I was, if I, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about you guys, I'm like, well, that's a man. That's a man's man. That's a three men. You know, um, I wouldn't say, yeah, it's, it's, there's only one man, you know, even though there are three who are men. Uh, you know, why? That's weird. Um, we're looking at those kind of features of the text and we're saying, you know, the way that the authors of scripture are constrained to talk itself reflects hmm. that they're talking about something, right? What is that something? So flipping it on his head, you could say, well, the idioms and the discourse and the grammar of scripture itself is an implication of the doctrine uh, well not, not, not the doctrine it's an implication of the trinity itself right mm -hmm. i mean given that the triune god reveals himself and he appoints prophets and apostles to speak of him then they are constrained since they're speaking mm -hmm. of this one right who is father son and holy spirit they're constrained to speak in these kind of odd ways mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah, that so does make, yeah rather yeah. than seeing the trinity as kind of an implication we're seeing no 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 the the, the ways that they're talking, right? And the things they talk about and, and the language they use, that's actually constrained by the reality itself. Hmm. Yeah. One, uh, one slightly cheeky comment that we couldn't quite put in an <laughs> academic book like, book like this. I don't know if you guys remember the old bumper stickers like uh, keep, keep blank city weird, keep yep. Portland yeah. weird, keep, keep, Portland weird. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Keep, yeah. keep Portland weird. You know, in some ways, what we're trying to notice are the <laughs> weird ways the Bible talks about the Trinity and about the person of Christ. Mm. And a lot of people's concern is, oh, theology, that like, that like cuts out the mystery or theology just tries to put God in a box yeah. or theology yeah. imposes right some type now. of that's rational thing to do. That's right. Thing. Theology. Yeah. Exactly. Theology imposes some kind of rational limit that will keep you from seeing the, the cool and weird stuff in scripture. No, no, no. Our motto is keep scripture weird and theology <laughs> helps. <laughs> We're going to add that to our yeah. motto of our show. <laughs> scripture yeah. weird. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's, yeah, that's, I think that it helps right. form people's minds for, for some of this stuff as, as they're <clears throat> coming into the text and coming into your book that'll, um, that'll, that'll help them read this uh, a, a little bit better. Um, I, I forget who's supposed to ask this que next question. So I'll, I'll ask it and they can follow up on this. Um, so your last, I think it's one of your last chapter, if not your last chapter, um, you pull all of these rules together 
um, for a reading of John 5. Uh, so can you, can you give our listeners, so maybe we've talked about some various passages here and there, but how, how do these rules that you're helping us read through, the Bible actually imposes upon us, it's been opposed by like kind of a Trinitarian framework. Um, how, how do we read using some of these, these rules and these frameworks that you're giving us that are coming from the text itself? Sure. Yeah. T Tyler, do you mind if I sort of run with that and you can chime oh, in? Please. Yeah. Bobby, this is Bobby's, uh, this is Bobby's chapter. So yeah, go for it. Man. Yeah. So this, it, so John five and especially verses 17 to 30 just seems to me to be a really fitting uh, kind of test course to take all of these things out for a spin because basically directly or indirectly, all these rules find something to say about this one passage. So just to set up the context, um, you know, Jesus has healed somebody. It turns out he healed him on the Sabbath, which we only learn late in the game. Uh, so his Jewish opponents are mad about him healing on the Sabbath. And his initial response to their charge in verse 17 is, um, my father is working until now, and I am working. So in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus often gives an account of, uh, you know, why maybe there's a sort of moral hierarchy, why there's some things that are so important that it's worth breaking the Sabbath for. And you find scriptural examples of this, but he doesn't do that here. He appeals to what his father is doing and says he's doing the same thing. And uh, this seems to be an appeal to the fact that God, as creator and sustainer, as life giver and life taker, God, in one sense, works on the Sabbath. He does the stuff that only God does, and he keeps doing it uh, even on the seventh day. So Jesus appeals to a rationale for his work that only works if <laughs> that same, as it were, uh, divine Sabbath exemption applies to him. And so then Jesus, uh, in th this, this basically uh, incenses his opponents even further. Now there's two charges. Not only is he breaking the Sabbath, but he's, uh, as verse 18 says, he was even calling, calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now there's two really interesting things about that. One is that this is, it, this is grounds for the charge of blasphemy. He, as they perceive him, a mere human being, is, in their sights, elevating him, himself, to be equal with God. That's, that's the kind of fundamental grounds of blasphemy, claiming something that only belongs to God. But interestingly, the very phrasing of the wording of, of what he said that makes them draw that conclusion is that he was calling God his own father. So there's a relationship here. It's not merely a claim of identity, though it is. He's claiming uh, that the stuff that's only true about God is true of him. But he claims it by calling God his own father. Uh, so then to flesh out those two aspects, uh, in the following verses, Jesus talks about how uh, he does the stuff that only God does. Like in verse 21, as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. So in one of the, one of the chapters that Tyler drafted, I think it's chapter, yeah, chapter four, worthy are you, understanding scripture as honoring God, Tyler lays out a widespread principle that you'll find in the church fathers, which is reading scripture in a God-befitting way. Uh, scripture is full of metaphors, anthropomorphisms, uh, applying creaturely realities to God in a metaphorical way. And so we need to read those in a way that recognizes God's unique transcendent power and glory and being. And uh, there are certain acts that are only fitting and that are only possible uh, of God himself, like giving uh, and re-giving life, giving life in the first place and raising the dead. So here Jesus claims for himself what we could call a God-befitting prerogative. Uh, only God can do this. You have prophets raising the dead, but ah, wait a minute. They don't do it by their own power. They pray and ask, and God pours out power in response to their petition, whereas Jesus claims he gives life to whom he will. So this is sort of picking up um, one of the earliest tools we develop, this God-fitting rule, where we, we understand that there are some realities that rightly pertain only to God, and Jesus claims those for himself. And you can get a lot out of the passage by looking at that. Uh, verse, verse 23, um, the Father has given all judgment to the Son so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So people are meant to honor, that is, worship the Son, just like, just as, in the same way as they worship the Father. And if, if Jesus is anything other than or anything less than God, that would be idolatry. Just like, just like blasphemy is claiming something for yourself that only belongs to God, idolatry is giving to someone or something the worship 
that only rightly belongs to God. So this kind of exclusive circle of what pertains only to God is a really crucial resource for understanding what Jesus is claiming about himself. But like we saw in verses 17 and 18, there's a relational aspect. There's a relative component. He claims these things by claiming God as his own father. And so, for instance, verse 26 becomes very crucial in understanding that relation. Jesus says, for as the father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. So life in himself is a properly divine prerogative. Uh, it's what theologians call aseity. God exists in himself in unbounded fullness. He possesses his own divine life completely in and of himself. He, he does not derive it uh, from another like we do as creatures. And yet, at the same time that Jesus claims that unique divine life for himself, we have to also see there's a specific manner in which he has it. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. This is why Jesus can give life, because he has divine life. He has life in himself. That's why he can give it to others. But the way that he has it is from the Father. So this is a unique divine prerogative. It's not creaturely life. It's not life with any kind of limit. It's uniquely divine life. But the manner Jesus has that divine life is he has it from the Father, which is an eternal Trinitarian relation of origin. In, in one sense, uh, there, there's a sense in which by seeing that in the text, uh, that pretty much is the whole doctrine of the Trinity right there. Mm -hmm. uh, that pretty much is the essence of it. And of course, John goes on to give a similar witness about the relationship of the Father and the Son to the Spirit. So extending that to the Spirit, 526, I mean, it's just slightly overstated to claim that John 526, you know, read in its biblical context and so on, really gives you the essence of the doctrine of the Trinity. At the very least, it gives you a, a window into, a witness of uh, Jesus's eternal relationship to the Father. And if we had more time, we could unpack how that, that plays out in verses 19 and 20 in terms of the manner in which Jesus exists, which is from the Father, explains why he acts the way that he does. He acts in the manner that he does, which is he acts from the Father. He exists from the Father, therefore he acts from the Father. So you have to talk about Jesus in two categories at once. Uh, that, that which he is and possesses, that makes him uh, united with and equal to the Father, and the manner in which he has it, which is in a relation from the Father. That's all, that's all right there in John 5. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and then there's John 10, verses 30 to 36, that are just amazing. Yeah, and develop many of the same themes. You know, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Yeah. Uh, right. and he, but he also talks about receiving from the Father, receiving his sheep from the Father. Um, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, the works that, that God has given him, uh, he doesn't use that exact phrase here, but he does in a lot of places. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Good works from the Father. Verse 32. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I don't know. Um, besides, besides this, if there's, if there's a, we, we kind of tease this on the front end, but if there's, if there's something that you'd like your, as, as we lay on this, is something you'd like your, your readers, the listeners to come away with after reading this book, you want them to be better at doing X. You want them to, to have a better toolkit at doing something. So what, what would that something be after they're, after they're done reading this book? Uh, well, I think we probably each have maybe, uh, you know, similar answers that like might, might be in different directions, but, you know, I, I think we, we both would want them to, to, um, to see the, uh, the inevitability of doing theology, right? And then the utility of serious, rigorous um, theological thinking, right? Um, <clears throat> for uh, exegesis and also the utility of very fine-grained, attentive, um, you know, uh, exegesis for theology. We, we want people to, to kind of do theological exegesis, not just talk about it. And uh, that's one of the things, I think for me, one of the things I really hope people walk away from is to see that we're not just trying to teach people um, some kind of clinical, you know, um, tools for exegesis. That's certainly one of the things that's going on. but what we're really trying to do is show that reading the Bible in this way is part of the Christian uh, life, right? And that it requires a, um, a wholehearted um, 
uh, devotion to Christ, um, a faith working by love. And so it requires a conformity to Christ. And that the more that we are conformed to Christ and the more that our, um, our loves are shaped by um, the love of Christ, uh, the more that the kinds of things we're talking about um, make sense and find applicability, you know, in, in, in the text and the more spiritual fruit they, they, um, they kind of uh, deliver. So, you know, it's that, it's that kind of unity of reading the Bible and, um, you know, not just pursuing Christ intellectually, but pursuing him uh, again, wholeheartedly. I think that's a, that's one of the things I hope people walk away from is seeing, Oh, you know, the moral life is not kind of separate from the exegetical life in our, yeah. Um, but yeah, Bobby, what's one of the kind of angles that you really hope people will kind of, uh, sure. See? Yeah. Very much, very much in keeping with what Tyler said, but maybe a specific way I'd say it is, um, you know, a, as a pastor and, you know, Tyler is involved in his local church and teaching too. Um, you know, I have the joy of, of having a lot of those light bulb moments um, like, you know, you, you teach somebody something and, oh, you know, seeing how the exodus is fulfilled in Christ is kind of a light bulb moment and helps helps uh, somebody connect the Old Testament better to their own experience or someone coming to understand that scripture is one big story from beginning to end. It's kind of a light bulb moment. Oh, I'm learning how to put the whole thing together. And I feel like I own scripture more. I think what I would say is. Um, you know, that this type of theological precision and discerning the realities of, of the Trinity and the person of Christ witnessed to in Scripture, they offer their own kind of light bulb moments for unlocking particular passages of Scripture. Um, I've seen this again and again. I mean, I, I remember a conversation with the elders of my church where we were actually talking through John 5, 26, and we're looking at some of these issues of eternal relations of origin. I think there were some light bulb moments of, of the elders of my church around the table of, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it's, it is divine life, but he has it from the Father. Oh, that's what it means that he's begotten. Um, I think there are a range of passages where you have that type of lights coming on. Um, that this is a, this is a toolkit that's complementary to those more redemptive historical tools or genre analysis type of tools uh, that in its own right, these things will open up scripture to you more deeply. And so ultimately give those kind of flashes of insight uh, of coming to understand scripture better and coming to know God better as a result. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so as, as we end this out, um, maybe we can start with, with you, Tyler, and then go to Bobby again. So where, where can people find you, find more of your work, find what you're, find what you're up to, and if there's any projects or, or stuff that you have working on that people could be looking forward to? People can find me uh, in New Orleans, right? Uh, at, at OBTS. <laughs> Our motto here is prepare here, serve anywhere. And I think that is uh, reflects the, the, the heart of the, the school. Um, you know, we uh, we train people here in New Orleans. New Orleans is a fascinating city, a uh, storied city, and uh, but also it's you know it's it's a city where there's a lot of, uh, of of need and opportunity. And so we encourage people to yeah. I mean, if you're ever uh, here, you just stop on by and um, be happy to you know buy you a snowball or some beignets. <laughs> and uh, wow. yeah, so that's what's people to find me. Um, you know. In terms of current work, I'm, I'm writing some stuff on uh, the Doctrine of Creation. I'm supposed to be writing some stuff on the Doctrine of Creation. Um, so at least one little book there, and that'll be forthcoming uh, probably within the next couple of years. And um, so, yeah, and uh, if you I'm just, you can Google my name and you can find, if you want to find more about me, <laughs> there's a little bit out there. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, great. Yeah, what about you, Bobby? Uh, you can find me at 525 A Street Northeast here on Capitol Hill. Um, <laughs> I keep, that's a <laughs> it's our church office. No, I mean, I keep a modest presence on Twitter. That's about it for social media. I, I have a website where people can find my email, but I don't, I don't really keep it up to date. Um, uh, yeah, and as far as current work, um, I have a back burner kind of longer term project on the Trinity and John's gospel, hopefully. Uh, I'll be teaching a class at RTS here in DC in the fall on John, so that'll be fun. Um, what I'm working on right now at the moment, I have a brief sabbatical, is actually a book on Ecclesiastes and trying to kind of distill and apply the whole message of Ecclesiastes in dialogue with some contemporary philosophy, uh, trying to do a little bit more apologetics, a little bit more application, uh, hope, but still at more of a popular level, hopefully an accessible way. Um, Ecclesiastes just really got under my skin when I preached it over the course of a year, about a year ago. And um, so I'm trying to dig deeper and go deeper. So pray for that. Awesome. Yeah, great. Well, we, we, won't, we won't tell people what we're doing for next season quite yet. 
Uh, but the stuff you're working on is very similar to the stuff we're going to be doing for the next season. So we, we may we may be calling upon your name again uh, pretty soon. Sure. I, I won't have a book to show for it, but happy to come back. No. Yeah, you'll, you'll have research. Maybe not a book, but you'll have you'll also research that may, that may help us out. That, that may give away more to our listeners than we think it is. Um, but yeah, if, if you guys want a little sneak peek, what Bobby's working on has a lot to do with our with our next season coming up. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing this book. Thanks for uh, kind of dipping your toes in or dipping our listeners toes into what you guys are writing and uh, giving us some concepts and, and hopefully they pick this up and read more and learn more about this and learn how to read their Bible better. And um, like you said, to behold Christ and, and see how he's presented to us in the scripture. So thanks for coming on. And we hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks brothers.